So I, I want to, um, so I think why don't we start with your background and your interest and how you got into this area? I think that'd be a great place to start. Sure. Okay. I, I, I don't often get to talk about myself, particularly here in, in my own recording studio. So that's kind of a nice treat, but sure. Let me, let me give you sort of the, uh, the reader's digest version of me. So I am uh, in my 30th year of law practice and about, oh, now about 15 years ago, I started my cannabis practice and that came about because back in 2010, Arizona had voted in its second, most people don't know, the second uh, medical marijuana program. There was an earlier bill that passed back in 96 and the legislature killed it. Um, excuse me, public initiative, not bill back in 96 and the legislature killed it. Uh, and the backlash of that resulted in a change to the Arizona constitution brought about by yet another public initiative that now really impairs the legislature's ability to impair public initiatives. So in 2010, uh, uh, an intrepid group of people came together and ran a political campaign to get our medical marijuana laws on the books, and it won. Now, back then, and we're really talking 2008, 2009, when the campaign started, there were like almost no lawyers that were willing to consider this, let alone touch it. It was a very contentious issue back then. And where we are seated today and looking back, it's changed so much so quickly. But back then, people were still really freaked out about it. But uh, the way I typically put it is, let's just say marijuana and I have been lifelong friends and I was always willing to help out a friend. So I saw this as a practice area that had potential. It already related to a lot of my law practice as existed at the time. So it was an easy jump for me to get into it. And I've been neck deep in it ever since. Up until that point, you would probably look at me and look at my law practice and just say I was just your average, typical suburban white guy lawyer. You know, nothing would have stood out that would have said, hey, one day this guy's going to go on and write books mm -hmm. about psychedelics and, and the law. But anyway, this did come to pass. So we got our medical marijuana law passed in 2010, and we were kind of inventing a lot of the law in front of us as it was forming and, and developing. Much of the existing law, so to speak, that we were all used to and accustomed to was still applicable to a degree, but because marijuana is, even to this moment, still federally illegal, everything had its own little funky little twist or spin. So nothing was normal in marijuana land, so to speak. Um, but anyway, in, in the process of, of developing this practice, I got a front row seat to see cannabis here in Arizona go from non-existence to now a more than $1.5 billion industry just in Arizona. And that's B, billion, buh, 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 billion, wow. big, big numbers. Uh, so that's exciting. And obviously we've, we've seen, uh, at the election during the pandemic, we got recreational on the books as well. So now we're living in Arizona in one of the most weirdly enough, progressive States visa marijuana. Um, there are other States that are kind of co-equal with us for legalization. You know, they look at Colorado, for example, um, they've got full recreational up there and many other States, California, et cetera. But uh, we're still in the minority as far as like the permissiveness. Mm -hmm. And Arizona, I will say to its credit, runs a fairly stable program. We've avoided a lot of the problems other states have had, which has been really beneficial. Uh, and it's been really nice. I've, I've had uh, over the years some really great clients, some not so great, but most of them great. Uh, and it's run the gamut. I have represented over the years uh, oh golly, every kind of stripe you could think of in the industry from cultivators to license holders to ancillary service providers and uh, different types of folks who do different types of uh, infused products, um, e even uh, folks who make dog food, um, which by the way, CBD dog food, very popular with dogs. Um, anyway, along the path of educating myself about things cannabis, I am a voracious reader and I'm one of these types who really likes to know my subjects well. So I'm constantly trying to self-educate and you unavoidably bang into other plant medicines as you read about cannabis. It's just a normal progression. And the more I read, the more I fell in love with the topic. It just 
devoured me and still does to this day because there's always something new when you look at this question. And especially when I started looking at like historical references, the fact that these substances have been not merely alongside humanity throughout history, but the fact that it's it's been integral parts of civilizations. There's arguments even that it's part of what supported human cerebral evolution. Um, and point the fact this is a foreshadow because I'm going to do a podcast on this in a few weeks. I just came across some articles talking about psychedelics being around during the time of the dinosaurs. And apparently some folks have analyzed genomes that they found in traces of um, pollen and spores trapped in ancient ambers. Mm. And were able to discern that these were from psychedelic species of mushrooms oh, wow. all the way back to the dinosaurs which in turn and i'm probably blowing my podcast now because i'm going to be mm -hmm. about this but i'm giving it to you now but yeah i i've been ruminating over the last couple of weeks of the thought of a t-rex walking around on shrooms and what that would look like mm -hmm. um, so if that is something that interests you uh you know think about it and go to bed tonight and dream on it and see what you think um anyway so as I'm diving into all this weirdness, and by the way, you know, stone dinosaurs is as weird as it can. <laughs> uh, I just, I just started to devour this, so I go looking for any books I can find on psychedelics and the law. And sh shocker, there aren't very many. There are a few, and the ones that are out there are quite good. Um, a hat tip uh, to Chakruna in particular; they publish several very good books. Uh, Bia Labate is um, probably at the fore of a lot of this, so um, hat tip to her as well. She does really good work. But from like a legal practitioner's perspective, there wasn't a book aimed at people like me who have like a daily law practice. So I said, okay, the book doesn't exist. I guess that's an obligation on me. I'll write it. And so I did. And this in turn became Psychedelic Alex, which um, I published just before the pandemic, hoping to just jump on the sort of um, nascent international psychedelics lecture circuit to help promote it. But of course, the pandemic happened, mm -hmm. but he was leaving the house. And that's how my podcast started and how I ended up building this studio was I needed an outlet to talk about this. And I was trapped at home and I had some free time in an extra room. So voila, the podcast got created. And then along the way, I had scraps left over from that book, which led me to a couple of years ago, publishing what I call a fun little tourist tchotchke book called Psychedelic Arizona. Uh, it's not thick by any stretch, but it's a lot of fun. And it's got, oh, I don't know, about two dozen chapters on all things psychedelic that are connected to Arizona. And I had, again, pieces left over from my research from Psychedelic Alex, and then I kept just doing a tiny bit more research and found that, man, Arizona's just got oodles of psychedelic connections. Uh, and by the way, it's in full color, and there's pictures in the book and everything. So, um, you know, this is a fun one for people to, to buy and give as gifts, I think. Uh, it's an entertaining little book. But yeah, Arizona's got crazy connections to the world of psychedelics. And it's every psychedelic I could imagine I was finding an Arizona connection. So that was a fun discovery as well. And then along the way, I also uh, came to find that here in Arizona is the oldest multiracial peyote church hosted right here in Arizona. And they've been here for decades and decades in part because they uh, did get into some entanglements in Texas where they started. And the problem in Texas was that Texas did not have a peyote religious protection statute, but Arizona did. So after uh, a couple tough court cases, the Peyote Way Church of God had relocated to Arizona and has been a fixture in the community ever since. And cannabis... You know, why do you think, how do you think like Arizona could be like a more conservative state, but yet one of the first to pass cannabis, you know, medical cannabis legislature? As, yeah, that seemed, you know, I was very like, yeah, like, how, how did that happen? I, you would think a conservative state would not embrace what it is, not even was, but is a Schedule One drug. And I think. Really, the credit goes to the people who changed the vocabulary in the conversation, because you will remember before people started calling it medical marijuana, they didn't. <laughs> they just called it marijuana. 
And I think the introduction of the word medical in front of marijuana helps hugely. I think that the conspicuousness and the absolute bravery of of people who were using cannabis medically mm. to be willing to come out of the closet, reveal themselves, share their stories, and make most everybody else comfortable is what made the difference. Uh, because up until that point, you know, I don't know about your generation, but I'm 55 years old and I grew up in a time of total prohibition. And in my time as a, as a young boy growing up through school, we had a lot aimed at us with the Nancy Reagan, just say no campaign. We had the police with their dare campaign. I, and again, I don't have kids, so I have no idea what they're doing today. But we were hammered over the head in my generation with, you know, drugs bad, all drugs are the same. Don't paint with any nuance. They're all the same thing. They're all bad. Stay away. But that's obviously changed. And I think it's because the vocabulary and the conversation changed and people were willing to be brave. And once your average conservative white suburban voter <clears throat> saw that the face of cannabis looked just like theirs, I think that's when things changed. And did you um, find medical, how did you find medical value in cannabis? And, you know, especially coming from, like you said, a generation where, you know, probably this would never have been a consideration. Yeah. And, yeah. Sure. Well, okay. I'll answer that on two levels, personally, and then also just, you know, professionally. So personally for me, yeah, I've been a patient card holder since our law passed. I've, uh, amongst qualifying conditions, uh, and actually, let me back up and lay a premise down here so the audience understands. Uh, here in Arizona, prior to the recreational law passing, and the recreational law allows you know adults over mm. 20 to engage, uh, but prior to that, you needed a, a medical condition that was one of uh, an enumerated list in the statute, and then you'd have to apply for and get approval through a medical process. You need to be seen by a doctor, get a get a recommendation, not a prescription, because you can't prescribe a schedule one, but you'd get a doctor's recommendation. And then you'd put in your paperwork for a patient card through the Department of Health Services, and they'd issue your card. And that gave you the right to go purchase and possess and consume. And if you had uh, certain geographic considerations, you also potentially then had a right to home cultivate. And at the time, and still now, I have had <laughs> at least three items on the list of maladies. Uh, but what I affectionately refer to as my shitty ankle is the one that qualifies me because I've, I've got like severe damage to an ankle. I'm missing chunks of cartilage in there. So it's like in a permanent arthritic state. Um, but it's real. And, you know, people like me applied and got cards. But I have known all stripes of people who have, for medical purposes, gone and gotten cards. Cancer patients, definitely high on the list. Um, and, you know, look, those those people deserve everything that they can get their hands on to try to help get them better or at least take away their symptoms. And that helped, too. I think that was a big face to the change when people were realizing, hey, you know, my mom's got breast cancer. And gee whiz, this cannabis makes my mom feel better. So, you know, who who's going to speak out against that? Yeah. And... With, the, with regard to the D.A.R.E. program, I, I'm not an expert and I never went through it, but I, you know, I heard from someone, but I haven't done my research, so that's why I'm asking. <laughs> um, the D.A.R.E. program, I heard, had maybe even a backfiring effect, like in the sense that, you know, they were teaching, you know, students about these drugs. And, you know, maybe when some of these students did more research or when they tried these, you know, they found holes, started to find holes in the story and the, and the propaganda. Oh and yeah. Then, yeah. Oh yeah. I can, I can remember as a kid sitting in school and, you know, you'd get these lectures like back in my day, we, they, they call them health class. I, again, I don't mm. do that, but mm. when I was that age, that's what they called it. And, you know, you'd get these lectures and yeah, you'd sit there and listen to these things that they tell you. And just, it just sounded like so much bullshit. Um, kids are smarter than people realize they're vastly more inquisitive than people give them credit for. And in the day of the internet, it's impossible to keep information out of people's hands. So we're dealing with a much smarter, sophisticated public today. And this includes your kids. 
Yeah. Um, so yeah, well, we can run through, you know, the law of psychedelics, because I think it's going to be really important for navigating, you know, people are going to want to use them, or people might want to, you know, go to a certain church, but they're not sure how the laws are on that, because they know it's a gray area. Mm -hmm. And then these things are still schedule one, you know, um, we also know, yeah, we could start at the very beginning, though, because certain cultures did use them and all of a sudden they were kind of disappeared from public view. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's, that's the crazy stuff that you start to get these epiphanies about once you start to open your mind to the education, which again is what I did. So what I found is that psychedelics of some variety or another, you pick whichever, uh, around the world throughout history, are always and have always been there. It's only like within our lifetime that we've gotten really weird about it. And I mean like the last 50 years, because prior to 1970, prior to the Controlled Substances Act, psychedelics were barely regulated, if regulated at all. <clears throat> Certainly not, you know, full on prohibition, but Come 1970, President Nixon uh, signs into law the Controlled Substances Act that now slams the door shut on these things, including cannabis. But prior to that, and I'm talking all the way back to the first bits of recorded human history, yeah, the world seemingly didn't have problem with this. Examples, uh, Greek culture subsisted for over 2,000 years with a, a ritual known as the Eleusinian Mysteries, a mystery religious cult that included a psychedelic concoction called kaikion. And citizens from around the Greek empire had the right to go and partake in this. And it was celebrated and people looked forward to it. It was a big deal. You know, you will find reference to this in Plato and Aristotle, for goodness sakes. Uh, but the deal was with with the um, Eleusinian Mysteries, you could only go once in a lifetime, and if you were a murderer, you were excluded. But you'd go once, you'd have your experience, and you were done. And for most people, that was enough. Like you, from what I understand in, in the existing archival record, it's not like ancient Greeks were jonesing to go back often and you know make it a part of their daily experience. Mm -hmm. It was a very special religious event. Now flip over to a different continent. Let's go to South America or Central America. Every civilization from the Olmecs through the Aztecs to the Mayas, they all had multiple different types of psychedelic substances in their religious rituals, in their normal pharmacopoeia. It was part of their medicine, part of their lives. And this includes up through to the modern time today. If you go down just south of the border to Mexico, if I point my car south and drive for an hour and a half, I will be in a place where there are still people and tribes today who engage as they did traditionally and, you know, observe <laughs> the world didn't end. Civilization didn't collapse. We're the ones in this country who are weird about it. And there are myriad reasons why none of them I think are very good. For example, if you look at how cannabis came to get on schedule one of the controlled substances act, there's literally no record of it. They just decided because President Nixon didn't particularly like hippies and Jews who were associated with cannabis in particular, that that was how he was going to get back at the counterculture by putting cannabis on schedule one. But Congress did not take so much as one minute of testimony describing or advocating why cannabis should or should not be on schedule one. We just had a bunch of conservative lawmakers who decided they knew better than literally everybody else. And so that's how you got your prohibition. Hmm. That is really interesting. I know there's this woman who just wrote a book on the history of her time with like Ram Dass and, you know, the Jewish counterculture and psychedelics. Um, it's... Margolin, she co-founded Double Blind magazine. Oh yeah, Madison Margolin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She just wrote a book about which I'm ho hoping to read really soon. You know, and there seems, but you're right. Like, didn't they find in an ancient Jewish some? Yeah, uh, you're 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 alluding to the uh, archeological find. Yeah, a couple of years back, 
uh, there was an archaeological study, and I can't from memory remember what temple it was, but folks at home, just Google it, you'll find it. It's it's not a difficult uh, search to perform. But yeah, they took scrapings off the altar at this many multiple thousand year old temple, like two, three thousand year old temple. And what they found was cannabis oil residue on this altar, which tells you, obviously, A, they were using it, and B, because it's a religious altar, they were using it for religious purposes. Now, if you cross-reference that little piece of knowledge back over to the Old Testament, you're going to find in the Old Testament recipes for, or recipe singular, for this religious anointing oil. And on the recipe list is an ingredient which is believed to have been mistranslated from the original. So like if you read like the King James Bible today, mm -hmm. uh, I think it'll say something like cassia, which has absolutely no effect on a human. So what I have read and what most people understand is this was a mistranslation of cannabosum, which is cannabis. And of course, cannabis does have an effect and would naturally make sense to be in a mm -hmm for an anointing oil that is reputed to have effects. So here now they go and scrape this altar and find, well, gee whiz, it is cannabis oil. So there you go. Uh, this stuff was known to ancient peoples and was used by them and revered by them. Yeah, that's interesting. I didn't know that um, he was, you know, he didn't like cannabis because it was associated with Jews. I mean, I know anti-semitism is a major problem worldwide and it's i mean even oh, in the last year oh uh, yeah really? <laughs> yeah um there are recordings of richard nixon in the oval office and by the way uh, let me just sidestep for a moment richard nixon was doing his own recordings in the oval office secretly oh, yeah. Secretly, oh, so when this all yeah, that's out, right yeah these that's tapes right. all got released i mean this is what led watergate to scandal is yeah. uh his ultimate uh, removal from office, his resignation and and then subsequent pardon, um, which, by the way, should have been tried and convicted because had that happened, I don't think we'd be living through current events, if you know what I mean. Mm, uh, yeah. uh, but in any event, yeah, Nixon had these tapes and it, there are archival tapes of Nixon just saying really heinous things about Jews and hippies oh, and wow. Okay. Uh, in fact, one of the episodes of my podcast, I talk about this and I include some of the recordings of Nixon saying these things. So if you dip into the Psychedelic Alex podcast archive and hunt down my cannabis episodes, you'll find this. Yeah. And everyone, you know, a lot of people who study the war on drugs and the history and they they go back to this article in Harper's Magazine, uh, an interview with John Ehrlichman and when like i think it was an interview from 1994 where john ehrlichman was asked about the war on drugs and prohibition and the article is called legalize it all in harper's magazine for anyone interested and john ehrlichman had said something along the lines that you know that the war on drugs what it was really all about you know wasn't you know for safety or protecting people it was about you know like you know, they not being against certain minority communities like the black and the hippie communities. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Cannabis prohibition is absolutely neck deep in racism. It, yeah. it, it the, the United States cannabis laws didn't really start until the 1800s, like the late 1800s. And there were a couple popcorn states in the southwest who were trying to push out or, or marginalize minorities. And at that time, the Mexican populations there did embrace cannabis. This was, you know, they were very attuned to a, a medicinal culture that included a lot of plant medicines. So it was very normal and natural for them. But it was also a thing that distinguished the Mexican population from the non-Mexican population and thus became a very easy target. And it and it became a target. And this, in turn, leads us out of the 1800s into the 1900s and then we get like the first federal narcotics bureau and people like harry anslinger who mm -hmm. are deeply racist oh my oh, god yeah. yeah and so now it's just you know injected on steroids and becomes what ultimately evolves into the controlled substances act but it, it was always from a legislative perspective 
a means and manner of control of population or subpopulations. It, it was never about science. It was never about health concerns. If you go and look at how these laws got enacted and the debates that may or may not have taken place in the legislature, they're not talking about health. They're not talking about you know good public order necessarily. They're just talking about controlling groups and, and not really setting good quality policy. And unfortunately, we still live with that today. Yeah, I mean, I think an example we, I've heard some people use, like Carl Hart, maybe I'm wrong, but, you know, whites and blacks, for example, probably use cocaine just as equally, you know, but um, blacks are overrepresented in our prison systems that are, you know, acute, you know, caught with cocaine, you know, it's still... Oh, yeah, uh, it, it, cocaine that's just one thing oh my gosh the aclu several years ago did a comparative study on uh, arrest rates and conviction rates just on marijuana and if you're black in america you have depending on the state you're in between a two and i think like eight times greater chance than your white counterpart of being charged or convicted here in arizona uh, our numbers were this was shocking our arrest and conviction rate for non-whites for cannabis once upon a time was 3.2 times the national average. But then when you oh. also compared that to the fact that we have like one-tenth the black population than other places, then that statistics oh, that wow. statistic really pops out because that's a really shocking number. Uh, and that's just Arizona. I mean, as you go state by state, it could get worse or a little better. Yeah, you know, the, how did, okay, Arizona had 10 cities. I mean, how did that even, how is that even like legal? You know, when it's gone now, but like, how is it, you know, if you want to tell people what 10 city is, who's not, who's oh. not in Arizona. <laughs> and, <laughs> yeah, you're going yeah. back to the Joe Arpaio days. So um, I, I will say up front, I don't do any criminal practice, so I'm not going to be very conversant on this. But yeah, there was a time when the Maricopa County Sheriff's Office to handle uh, the prison population and the overflow, because they only had so much physical space inside the jail, they needed more places to put more people. So they built out door, you know, but fenced in tent, not well, they call it tent city, but I mean, it's not literally a city, but, you know, tent camps where they, they'd keep inmates. Now, you know, you might think, well, gee, it's outdoors. You get a lot of fresh air. Isn't that nice if you're an inmate? Yeah, this is Arizona. Do you know what it's like in fucking August <laughs> outside? It's 120 in the shade if you're lucky. Mm -hmm. So uh, this was an unpopular thing with the inmates. It was an unpopular thing with the families of the inmates. It did ultimately go away, but yeah, for a time, we definitely had Tent City, and also uh, the, the Sheriff Arpaio did not like spending money on food, but unfortunately for him, federal law requires that you actually keep your inmates alive, so um, uh, amongst other things, he also had this food item called Neutral Loaf that was like the main meal for a lot of these prisoners, and it was some sort of like pureed, extruded, and then recombined mishmash of vegetables and God knows what else into something that looked like a meatloaf. And I've never personally had it, but I can readily imagine it didn't taste anything like a meatloaf. So the yeah. lesson is you really don't want to go to jail if you can avoid it. Um, and, and I will say also, uh, again, I don't do a criminal practice, but I have had to visit people in jail for a variety of things. And uh, all I can say is the Maricopa County lockup is just a carnival of aromas. You don't want to go there. Trust me. Yeah, that's really crazy. And yeah, er, like you said, Arizona has a long psychedelic history. So there seems to be a lot of contradictions in Arizona. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, and, and speaking to that too, when I was looking at different statistics, um, you know, obviously I was looking specifically for cannabis, but I looked at other things. Psychedelics as a category barely shows up in criminal okay. in Arizona. So the oh. Department of Public Safety does, um, as most every agency here in the state does, annual reports. And this is part of their function. And these are public, by the way. And if anybody's ever curious, just go online. You can go to the Department of Public Safety's website and pull the report down, or you can go get a copy from the Secretary of State. 
But they do this annually. And, you know, as a Department of Public Safety would be expected to do, they're publishing crime statistics and they break it down by different crime types. And then when it gets to drugs, they also subdivide it further into different categories of drugs. So you can see, for example, you know, what your fentanyl arrests are, your marijuana arrests, or your cocaine. But psychedelics is in this catch all other category and they don't further subdivide it. So you can't see if it's mushrooms or iboga or something else. And it, it like, I don't think it even clocks in at a percentage point. It is so statistically irrelevant in Arizona because it's just not a thing. You know, are there people who, you know, one off are getting arrested? Yeah, absolutely. A couple of uh, months ago, I did an interview with uh, another criminal defense lawyer, Charity Clark, talking about a gentleman that she helped here in Arizona get out from underneath a very serious charge of having possession of a lot of different things, including peyote and psilocybin mushrooms. And I think he had a couple tabs of LSD as well. Uh, but it does happen, but it's incredibly rare. Okay. You know, one of my favorite quotes from your book, and I agree with this, because I, I feel like fundamentally, and I think this is, you know, Jennifer Murphy's doing a really good case against the United States uh, you, you know, with this. I don't know if you know Jennifer Murphy. She's fighting a legal court, Jennifer Murphy versus the United States, um, which is supposed to be like a really huge court case, you know, against the war on drugs, supposedly. She's here in Arizona. Mm. Um but your, my favorite quote from your book from the beginning is this quote, after all, if we allow government to control human consciousness, is not then freedom of thought an illusion, end quote. That's what I feel like, you know. That's something I would have written. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, everything I can think of, you know, every, every th reason I've heard people use the war on, you know, justify the war on drugs, I feel like can always trace back to some kind of thought crime, according to the person who's advocating for it. You know, if they don't like hippies, well, it's not because of the people usually, right? I mean, it's what they represent and the ideas and who they yeah. are. Yeah, and that comment in particular, I was aiming that at the notion of a term called cognitive liberty, which yeah. is kind of this little warren in, in legal theory circles. It's not like a real mainstream concept or thing mm -hmm. I don't really have any statutes or bodies of law i can point to that speak directly to cognitive liberty but it's this notion that if we have freedom of speech under first amendment then mm -hmm. we at least have freedom of the thought that led to the speech and exactly. correspondingly if you're being told that you're not allowed to alter your consciousness to change your thoughts well, then who's really in charge of you? So this is an area that I think definitely needs further expansion and exploration. And I think young lawyers who are looking to sort of cut their teeth in cutting edge areas, this is one of them. Uh, the catch, though, is for a young lawyer who's getting out of law school and has, you know, a one or two hundred thousand dollar student loan, as many of them do, this doesn't pay well. <laughs> so just wow. Head, heads up on that. But, you know, if if money is not going to be an impediment, this is an interesting place to try to expand into the attacks on prohibition and excessive regulation. Um, emphasis on the word excessive, because I am not opposed to some level of regulation, as long as it's reasonable and still fosters good access. For example, mm -hmm. my concept of good regulation would mean uh, assuring that there is quality, unadulterated products. So if somebody is mm -hmm. trading or trafficking or engaged in commerce in these substances, the things they are selling should be what they say they are selling. You know, you don't want to open up a package and discover now you're consuming something that's filled with lead. Yeah, I actually believe Jennifer, that's, or, um, that's what she's, she's going to use an argument of this form, a much more sophisticated, you know, I don't, I haven't really read it through it all. Um, and I think that's a good way to go if we can really actually make that case, which I believe is the truth. Um, yeah, you know, one I, of the I think it's a natural extension out of First Amendment, but I, I think also there are core due process and equal protection arguments that come right out of the heart of the Constitution itself that also could apply. Mm -hmm. 
like you know, we know throughout history the you know the catholic church you know their colonialism you know they considered you know for example the peyote use or magic mushroom use to be like demonic oh liter you know? literally literally <laughs> they they considered it to be of the devil so to them it was blasphemous it was you know it was wrong to practice and use these things to try and change their mind because to them it was the wrong kind of change your mind and so to them it was they wanted to completely just squash it and yeah uh, well when we're talking the conquistadors and and their conquest of central and south america and and their extermination of these practices it was in part because there was a clerical contingent with the conquistadors leading the way who of course wanted to reprint all of the native religions and replace them with Catholicism. But for the conquistadors themselves, this was also a method of subjugation and control, because if you could shatter the native population's religious practices, that demoralizes them. And then also, uh, to some extent, the locals were also using substances to assist them in resisting the colonization, and also they would take it to assist them in the literal physical fighting. So, you know, you're taking away this this core substance, but the motivation there is really to undermine a civilization. It, you know, the religious stuff, yes, absolutely, that was part of it. But I think from the conquistadors perspective, it had so much more uh, going on for them. So, you know, we know how history went. Yeah. What do you think of Timothy Leary's hypothesis that psychedelics, you know, are can help induce like anti-authoritative or sorry anti-authoritarian you know like um and tendencies or expressions yeah um it certainly can you, you know uh, as people who have experienced these substances you know what they can do they they will liberate your mind from a lot of the uh self-imposed shackles that are there they can help to expand your consciousness so that you just gain a different perspective. And once you gain that additional perspective, you see life through a completely different set of eyes. Metaphorically speaking, you don't literally grow different eyes. Yeah. Sure, somebody at home is like, what, psychedelics? <laughs> no, no, we're talking in metaphor, kids. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, it absolutely can. Um, but as far as Leary goes and wanting to kick off some sort of a global revolution, yeah, I think that's where Leary failed and went off the rails. I have a real love-hate relationship with Leary. He absolutely gets credit. He's absolutely integral, indispensably integral to the revolution, so to speak. But I think at the end, he got a little comical, took things too far, was too unreasonable. And I mean, look how he ended. He was a fugitive. He escaped from prison. I mean, just that's not a good way to go. So I, I think there's equal parts admiration and equal parts criticism to be directed at him. But I don't want to besmirch the legacy because he provided way more important than than not. And that needs to be recognized. Mm -hmm. I do think people falsely accuse him of, you know, like uh, Richard Nixon's war on drugs and all of that, because it probably was going to happen anyways, you know, whether there was a Timothy Leary or not. Oh, yeah. But, yeah, yeah. Uh, but, but, you Timothy know, Leary. movements need leaders, and Leary was willing to step up and be one of those people, which is why he gets a lot of credit and deserves it. Yeah. And, okay, so obviously we have a long history of, use among many different cultures and not even just humans you know but, oh yeah and... yeah the tons of animals <laughs> use psychedelics and tons of animals are psychedelic yeah oh. exactly yeah yeah um we could, that, we could by the way that's that's your that's your your koan to ponder this weekend do psychedelic toads lick themselves <laughs> Oh God! <laughs> yeah. You know, and they, by the way, uh, for folks at home, don't don't lick toads, and and yeah, don't, don't go hunting the bufo. <laughs> it didn't bother you. Don't bother it. If you want your five meo DMT, go get it elsewhere. Leave the toads alone. They're already having enough trouble out there in the environment. They don't need you fucking with them. Yeah, same with the peyote cactus. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I mean, what is your thoughts 
about that. I mean, within the Native American church, for example, among a lot of the indigenous here who use it, um, they they believe for spiritual reasons and and their um, uh, sacred beliefs that you know growing it yourself is going to take away from the spiritual aspect. Um, you know that's why they don't they don't want us growing them in green rooms for the church for the Native American church. I don't know about the peyote church way of God, but. I'll let you. Yeah. Um, okay. So this is on a spectrum of religious belief, and I'm not going to say that any religious group is right or wrong. It's whatever you mm -hmm. guys believe. You know. Look. Yeah. There's there's literally a religion called the Church of the Flying Spaghetti Monster. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> they believe in an actual giant cosmic flying fucking spaghetti monster. Is it real? I don't know, but I like spaghetti, so I'm cool with it. Uh, mm -hmm. But kidding aside, yeah, there's there's all different iterations of of belief. When it comes to the peyote itself, here's my personal take. And coincidentally, this is a position shared by the Peyote Way Church of God. But to be clear, I'm not here as an advocate for that church. So this is just me speaking. The peyote cactus is a very, very delicate cactus. It's a very vulnerable cactus. It's one of a small number of cacti that has not a single spine on it. Its only protection mechanism is that concentration of mescaline within it. Mm -hmm. It also has the dubious distinction of being about the slowest plant on the planet. To go from seed to an adult peyote takes you like 30 years. So it's slow. You've got to be patient. And now we add climate change and human encroachment into the conversation and the fact that this is a cactus that only grows in certain climate zones in the world, we happen to live in one of those climate zones here in Arizona, so we're lucky, but, you know, not every place is a, is an arid desert, or excuse me, a, a, not an arid desert, but the other type of desert, because we do get rainfall here. I'm not talking like Sahara dry. Um, so knowing all of that, this plant is, if not actually from like a federal law perspective endangered it's about as close as you get and it's only going to get worse it's not going to get better so now you juxtapose that with this new world of enlightened approach towards psychedelics it's not difficult to imagine that people are going to be curious about it and want to experience it here's the, the problem is they've got a diminishing quantity in a world that's increasing in interest. Don't think restricting cultivation is a good idea because I think it will ultimately lead to the demise of this poor innocent little cactus. So I think home cultivation or industrial type cultivation in a greenhouse is really the, the peyote's best chance of long-term survival, especially individual cultivation by individuals, because you can disseminate this plant across a, a wide geographic area, because if you're growing these things at home, you're probably doing it indoors, you're keeping it safe, and you'll be able to keep a good, robust genetic line alive because you're spreading it out. Uh, compare, for example, to modern bananas. Today's banana that you and I enjoy when we go to the grocery store is predominantly, if not exclusively, the Cavendish banana. It's a sterile mm. hybrid. There's not a seed in that damn banana, which is why we all enjoy them. But mm. because of, of genetic degradation and also climate change, the Cavendish banana within our lifetime will die out. It will cease to mm. exist. So in our mm. lifetime, we will be eating a different banana that's got a different banana profile. And that's the same risk of any plant. If you over cultivate, you over hybridize, you weaken genetic pools, which is why, for example, in the world of cannabis, you may have heard the term land race, which are natural occurring genetic variations in cannabis that you find in the wild. There are cultivators who are obsessive with going out in the wild and finding these so they can bring the genetics back. It's like mm -hmm. finding gold. Um, so same is true, you know, for, for uh, these poor little peyotes. If you disseminate them, you give them a better chance of survival. Now I want to get into this in a minute, but freedom of religion and religious practice, because that's going to play a role in the entheogenic churches. Sure. And, um, you know, how this all, that all this ties in together, because, you know, the war on drugs 
you know, that we have these religious freedoms for entheogenic churches because there's a war on drugs and because there's this conflict in the law. And also, one other thing we probably want to talk about as well after soon is, you know, state versus federal. I know we have the Ninth and Tenth Amendments. I don't know if, if uh, most of the people listening are that familiar with those. Um, so, like, well, you know, like, so let's, you know, so we can get to the entheogenic churches and the yeah. Santo Daimi and the Unia de Vegetal and peyote, um, the peyote churches. How did we even get a war on drugs? I mean, didn't, they started when in the late 1800s and how did they justify those? Ah, uh, okay. Well, the, the war on drugs depends on how wide you want to open the aperture and look. In modern history, you need really only go back to 1970 to know what's going on today because it's the Controlled Substances Act that encompasses and codifies that war on drugs. But if you go back deeper in time, you actually find that psychedelics got lumped in with a uh, term narcotics which is really not the correct label for psychedelics because psychedelics are not narcotics but legally speaking that's how they were shunted into the definition mm -hmm. um but the real air quotes first war over drugs that exists in anything of modernity is probably the opium wars between the british and the chinese and mm -hmm. in turn that was what sparked some of the first international laws regarding the trade in opium and even then did not prohibit it just sought to regulate it and mostly for tax purposes <laughs> they just mm. got to get their cut right uh but that evolved over time and and morphed and warped and became more and worse and became what we have now but it all started because the british shot their way into china to be drug dealers. And by the way, if you want to understand the, the notion of modern Chinese political thought vis-a-vis -vis the West, mm -hmm. study the opium wars because they will tell you about how modern China got started. And it was at yeah. the end of a British gun. Yeah, that's true. I mean, Hong Kong, right, was a British... Kong. Yeah, well, Hong Kong was part of the concession after the the Second Opium War and the British had shot up China a second time. Uh, they ended up doing this treaty that resulted in a variety of concessions from the Chinese government to the British, which included a 100 year lease on Hong Kong. So you'll know several years ago that lease expired and this was all over the news because people were really worried about what's China going to do. And it was weird to me because people were railing on saying, well, how can they give Hong Kong to the Chinese? It was always theirs. It was under a lease that was signed at the end of a gun. It was yeah. always China's property. It was always going back to China. And anybody who was living there or having a business there or having a life there always knew this so anybody acting like it was a surprise or they don't like the changes now that the chinese government took over mm -hmm. only a little bit sympathetic because they get it you grew up there maybe and you thought you had a certain life but look it was never yours yeah that is unfortunate because i feel hong kong had a lot more freedoms economic freedoms especially oh, it, did. it did it did but now it's it's under the chinese government and they just have a different yeah. way of doing things i wouldn't choose to live there myself i wouldn't want to live under that yeah. <laughs> uh yeah. but you know a billion people do so you can't just ignore it yeah but taiwan wasn't under chinese rule yeah, well, right the, I mean, taiwan's a whole other thing yeah, that's a whole other thing. Exactly. I don't want anyone thinking. Yeah, after yeah. the Maoist <laughs> revolution, that the the democratic Chinese uh, had to retreat to Taiwan, and that's where it is they are today. Uh, the Kuomintang is uh, the name of that political organization. Yeah, they had to retreat because the Maoist forces were going to kill them all, so they retreated to Taiwan. But that's you know, if you want to talk about that just for a second, Taiwan is the contentious point because the Chinese government insists the island is theirs. But really, technically, it never was. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, you know, do you want to put human lives at risk or at least American lives at risk if it came to it? Just mm. to that point. And I don't know if it's worth anybody dying. There's almost no cause that I think justifies people dying.
Yeah, I mean, we are allies with them, and they do have the number one chip manufacture, manufacturing, like the number one most advanced, and it does, mm -hmm. you know, that we do have actual interest in maintaining, you know, the positive relationship with them. And Oh, absolutely. Them. But, you know, to that point, if uh, all that chip manufacturing suddenly found its ways into uh, America's shores, how much do you think America's going to care about Taiwan after <laughs> Yeah, I, I guess. You should, because it's still a human <laughs> issue. But, you know, yeah. the people in power, and in particular, the people with money interests, uh, you know, like money's loyalty is to money, nothing else. So you said, and I don't know this history at all, but I didn't, you said as the opium wars, you know, especially the British with, you know, the Chinese. Mm -hmm. I mean, you said, is it solely a money, was it solely a money and tax purpose? Or was there like really like racist motives there too oh no with but... the opium wars no that was all about okay. money that was all okay. about money oh. the, the the short story is this the the british had their opium fields in india and of course we're always looking for markets to sell it meanwhile they were really interested in chinese goods because the uh, chinese produced a lot of stuff british people like silk spices different manufactured goods uh but the problem is when you're doing international trade buying stuff from a country is great but you need something to pay with it and the british really struggled to find anything that the chinese wanted and on top of that the emperor was really not down with opening up china to outsiders so they confined uh, ultimately this very small trade zone and only appointed a handful of ministers to administer that trade zone so the British over time were finding that they were spending all of their silver because that was like the only thing the Chinese really wanted from them was silver. But silver was the currency of the empire at the time. And if you're literally physically emptying your bank accounts out of your silver, you're finding now you don't have that silver to go into other markets and engage in commerce like you're used to. So the British were desperate to get the silver back so they could get it back into circulation. So they were trying to find other commodities that they could trade with the Chinese. Well, it turned out that opium is popular as it is in any human population. So they started to uh, press opium into the, the Chinese empire. And then the emperor got kind of upset because there were some bad effects from that, as one would expect. And ultimately, the emperor had a uh, fit over this and rebelled and, and had directed the opium to stop. So the British, of course, uh, started to smuggle it with the aid of other Chinese citizens and ended up getting a significant portion of the Chinese population hooked on opium, which in turn did a lot of damage economically and politically internally to the empire and did ultimately weaken it to the point of its demise. So what then happens, uh, the Chinese decide to completely forbid opium and they order the destruction of some opium laden ships that were British that were in the harbor near Hong Kong. And they did. They destroyed those ships, sort of like a Boston Tea Party experience. And of course, the British were none too happy about that and went to complain to the king, who's like, hey, that's my money, too. So they sent a bunch of British warships up into China, shot the place up and forced the Chinese emperor to uh, basically concede. And this resulted in tremendous economic reparations that the Chinese had to pay to the British government and, and to the British trading company, including paying for the opium they destroyed. And in turn, this uh, resulted in, amongst other things, that 100-year lease over Hong Kong. So now, when you look at that, and then you see what happened next in Chinese history, the revolution started, uh, there were multiple factions, and then ultimately the Chinese communists under Mao won. And this takes you from the mid-1800s through to the early 1900s, and thus you have what we now know as modern China today. And so, yeah, this is part of the fascination I have when I discovered psychedelics and started reading about it, is this thing weaves itself into global history, global religion, mm -hmm in amazing and unexpected ways yeah that's i don't know 
would you recommend any reading resources about this? Because I don't actually know. Um, yeah, really well, there's no particular book that comes to mind. There's tons of history books on this and tons of really good videos, too. Uh, for example, like a, a lot of evenings, you know, people will sit down and watch TV at night. I, I'm not a TV show guy, so I'm typically watching documentaries on, on YouTube or other streaming channels. So I just I like to constantly feed the brain. So this is the stuff I do at night. I'm, I'm you know, learning of these things. So how does this get, you know, into the United States in the late 1800s? Because, of course, we're independent now, you know, from, you know, the British Empire and all yeah, that. Yeah. Yeah. And then until 1912, the International Treaty and stuff. So Yeah. So th this evolves then coming out of these opium wars. Uh, there's international trade in, in opium. And in fact, you for most of the United States history, you could go down to your local pharmacy or whatever served as your local pharmacy. And you can get, you know, these opium based yeah. products. This was very normal part of U.S. pharmacopoeia. Uh, again, this weirdness we're living with is very recent compared to the, the span of history. But what it started out as was uh, opium adulteration laws. They were concerned about purity. They wanted to make sure you were getting good shit. And it was law that you would only be getting good shit. So unfortunately, it continued to evolve and went from quality care to prohibition. And weren't there Chinese workers in California who were using... Oh, yeah, or yeah, yeah, yeah. Them. Immigrant populations, uh, inevitably, there is always some presence of something. Yeah, you know, I, I mentioned earlier in the conversation how in the uh, American Southwest, Mexicans were using cannabis and were derided for that. Uh, very common. Um, yeah, Chinese with, with opium, yeah, also very common. If you look at uh, archival pictures of San Francisco, there were opium dens there. Uh, in fact, depending on what the quality is of antique stores around where you live, you might be able to find old opium pipes and opium beds. Uh, they'd have um, places you could go and you could, you know, buy your opium and, you know, I guess rent a pipe, I suppose. And they'd have these beds you could lay on and you'd smoke out and enjoy yourself. Uh, and this was also a thing you would find in, in England, for example. There were definitely opium users uh, up through the 1800s. Uh, and oh yeah and i forgot to ask earlier the term marijuana you know obviously in the medical community we'll call it cannabis now but marijuana is that a spanish word and how did the yeah I know there's been some misconceptions so i don't know That's a, but... yeah it, it's a derogatory word so you, you'll notice i try to use the word cannabis and as you mentioned earlier i'm one of the founding directors of the arizona cannabis bar association and when we created the association, we had a deliberate conversation on what to name it. And we all knew that the word marijuana had negative connotation, bad history, and it was a racist term. You know, it was aimed at these Hispanic populations who used it. So we decided we were going to use the Linnaean taxonomic name of cannabis because that is the fair and neutral way of referring to this plant. And so, yeah, we call it the Arizona Cannabis Bar Association, and I'll refer to it most commonly as cannabis. Yeah, I had read by, I think a, he, he's a cannabis historian. I can't remember his name right now. He was saying that maybe the original use of the term marijuana had no racist connotation. It was just the word that certain people used for the plant. But later, you know, maybe colonialists or whatever, oh. Yeah. To... Maybe at the beginning it wasn't racist, but it's mm -hmm. beyond question that yeah. it turned into that. You know, <laughs> by the time you get to like the twenties and Anslinger, yeah, it's a hundred percent racist. Yeah, yeah. So Anslinger was the head of the Bureau of Narcotics, which mm -hmm. was the precursor to the DEA, Drug Correct. Enforcement Agency. Yes, sir. yes. And yeah, he was a very like you mentioned earlier, very outward racist, and he was probably the reason why Billie Holiday, you know, was murdered in the hospital. You know, there's a movie about this, Billie Holiday versus the United States, hmm. and also Johan Hari's book uh, about the war on drugs. I think it's, I forget the name right now, but he talks about this story. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um uh, of cannabis in particular, have you heard of Jack Herrera's book, The Emperor Wears No Clothes? I've heard of it. I haven't read it. Okay, that is a must read. If I, I, I recommend a lot of books, but this is definitely on the list of must reads. 
So Jack Herrera wrote this book called The Emperor Wears No Clothes. And he, he wrote it, I think, in the late 70s, early 80s. And if you want, I can grab. I've got a copy of it on my shelf over here. Okay. Uh, but the story of Jack Herrera is this. He And it's weirdly parallel to my own. He was a normal guy who was not into marijuana at all. Just you know, middle class, stiff dude who... Um, just one day just got it in his head to, you know, give it a try. And it flipped a switch in his head and he became probably for his time, one of, if not the singularly biggest advocates. And he ended up going on a rampage of research and compiled it into this book now known as the emperor wears no clothes. And I think it's had multiple publications. It's probably like in its 14th or 18th edition now, I don't know, some crazy number, but it's been around forever. And it's a fantastic book. Uh, if you can't afford to buy it new, occasionally you'll find it in bookstores, uh, used bookstores like here in Arizona, there's a, a used bookstore chain called Bookman's. Uh, that is actually where I got my copy. But um, it's still available new. You can get on Amazon. And it's a compilation of just these historical records that he pulled because he went and pulled congressional meeting and committee notes and all sorts of stuff. And it's in this book. And it's just eye-opening. And ultimately, what you walk away from this understanding is marijuana just got prohibited because people didn't like other people. It had nothing to do with the plant. That's crazy. So yeah, as with the opium wars, this gets into a new topic. Um, Nineteen twelve, right? It was that was like a international opium convention. Yeah, was that with the League of Nations or mm -hmm. the precursor yeah, the of the United Nations? Yeah, started the these international drug treaties. And again, originally it really just focused on opium, you know, nar narcotic from the uh, poppy plant, the papaver somniferum. Uh, mm. Which, by the way, here's weird. You can actually go buy opium poppy seeds at your mm. local drugstore or grocery store, and you can grow them. You, you It's not illegal to grow opium poppies. Uh, it does become illegal if you extract from them or if you mm -hmm. grow at industrial scale. Because the reality is, if, if you're really wanting to start a, an opium farm for the narcotics, it's a lot of plants. You need a lot to get enough material to concentrate to actually be useful in a population. So resultingly, there are gardeners all over the country who grow these beautiful poppies because they're beautiful plants. I've mm -hmm. had you in my garden over the years, and they're gorgeous. They absolutely produce these beautiful petals, and they're lovely flowers. Um, but yeah, you can you can get them, but if you tip over into now extraction, you're tipping into felony zone. So mm -hmm. Don't do it, obviously, but if you want to look at a beautiful flower, they're beautiful. Yeah, the same goes with, you know, San Pedro, right? I mean, yeah, you can do that legally. Yeah, so that's weird, too. Um, mescaline is a scheduled narcotic. It's not permitted. But it grows naturally in a number of cacti, and weird, uh, the, the peyote cactus is specifically called out on Schedule 1, but mescaline also on Schedule 1 does appear in a variety of different cacti. So for example, the the um, if you go down to your Home Depot, you can go buy these San Pedro cactus, these columnar cacti, they also produce mescaline. Um, part of uh, Psychedelic Arizona, if I can plug my book again there, mm -hmm. uh, I discovered that it's really, really trace, but the saguaro has mm. it teensiest bit of mescaline in it but before anybody gets excited if you actually wanted to feel the mescaline you'd probably have to ingest the whole saguaro uh so it's a deal killer for everybody yeah how did that happen like you know the, with both plants i mean my by the way uh, if anybody wants michael pollan and his newest or his book uh how to change your mind or sorry no the no, that's an amazing book too. The one after the "This Is Your Mind on Plants," he has three. He goes. He has three sections in there, but one section is about mescaline, uh, and he actually goes and takes mescaline and documents it and talks about a lot of things. But one of the other ch sections is about him growing the poppy somniferum, you know, opium poppy, mm -hmm. and how eventually he had to. He, you know, he's a gardener, and eventually he had to stop growing it because he. He became very fearful that the DA was cracking down on a lot of places that were selling the seeds and stuff. And mm -hmm. he felt like in the 90s, the crackdown on opium was 
quite strong, but he documents that quite like he's a, he's a good writer. He's like it's still it's a page turner. Yeah, and and then, Paul, Paul is a great writer. If he uh, the backs of cereal boxes, I'd want to read those boxes. Yeah, and he actually ends up trying the he actually makes the um, the opium tea and tries it. And he explains his um, experience in there. And this was from the 90s when he wrote this, but he incorporated it in his book, new book. And I thought it was a really beautiful read for those interested. Yeah, by the way, this ties in well with like people like Carl Hart, who, who's out advocating for the legalization of narcotics, which is not mm -hmm. psychedelics. And let's it's worth just revisiting that point for a moment. I know we've said that earlier in the conversation, but we've been on this long jaunt now for a while on on opium but yeah they are not psychedelics they're very yeah. different things but the point though that i think carl makes and also ties into exactly what you were saying is there are degrees of type and concentration of narcotics particularly coming from the opioid family and historically and even to this day opium plants poppy plants are still used medicinally and recreationally throughout the world the concentration oh yeah the war on drugs itself is actually incentivize higher concentrations yeah absolutely absolutely yeah um uh, you know uh, well let's analogize to marijuana the the reason why you had this explosion of a black market marijuana in in the united states after the 1970s was in part because of the war against marijuana growers had to get more clever in how they were growing and this in turn gave rise to these varieties of hybrids uh, let me explain sativas and indicas are your two dominant consumable cannabis there's there's also ruderalis which i call runteralis because it's a runty little plant and it's usable but not really Okay. But the main distinctions between sativa and indica, not just being that one is more buzzy and one is more sleepy, is mm -hmm. that the sativa is a very narrow, tall plant, and it can grow 15, 18 feet tall. That's mm -hmm. hard to hide and certainly hard to grow an 18 foot tall plant indoors. Indica, by comparison, shorter, bushier. Uh, mm -hmm. And this was the plant that like our soldiers going over to Vietnam encountered and were like, hey, this is pretty good. Bring it home. Mm -hmm but they had to be able to grow it and duplicate it here in the U S but domestically we had sativa. So in order to have these clandestine grows, they started to cross pollinate and hybridize these things to get your air quotes, your modern cannabis plants. Yeah, that's good. So how do, yeah, so we get to international treaties. What are those? I think we have three major ones, 1961, 1971, yeah. And how are they enforced or how do they impact current drug laws in the U.S. or any country? Sure, sure, sure. So um, in the hierarchy of law within the country, you're going to start at the lowest level, which is like your municipal laws, like your ordinances, that kind of thing. Then you'll step up to state regulations and state statutes and then state constitution on top of that. At the federal level, it tracks similarly. You'll have federal uh, regulations, federal statutes, and of course, the federal constitution. Now, when the United States or any country chooses to, it can enter into international treaty. And when it comes to drugs, of course, the United States has. So mm -hmm. what the treaties do are a variety of things, but amongst those domestically is that members to these treaties are typically expected and required to conform their domestic laws to what the treaties say. So if you look, for example, at our Controlled Substances Act, and then you go look at like the um, Convention on Psychotropic Substances, you're going to see strangely familiar schedules with strangely yeah. familiar lists of drugs. And then if you go into other member nations and you go compare their domestic statutes, again, also to that international treaty, you're going to see tremendous similarity. So it's basically a systemization of drug policy amongst member nations that is aimed at some sort of a cooperative uniformity. And principally, it's it's um, for preventing international narco trafficking and also to foster uh, a system in which countries can exchange information about narco trafficking, including for police interdiction. Yeah. Um, 
and that's how we were able to because the United States basically the architecture of this you know these some of the most of these laws right and we were this is like how we were able to impose it basically on the rest of the world because I don't think most countries you know we're gonna have such a strong war on drugs until yeah it depends on your country you know like I, I I don't know this at all for a fact um but I could readily imagine for example like a country like Colombia probably would want less restrictive laws because a, a lot of these substances come out of Colombia. And and by the way, I'm not just talking illicitly. I'm talking illicitly. Uh, there are lots of farms and lots of production in Colombia for a lot of drugs that you and I uh, enjoy at our local pharmacy getting, you know, scripts from our doctor. So from a pharmaceutical perspective, this can have an impact as well. I'm not merely talking about you know, illicit or twilight uh, stuff exclusively. Okay. Um, what what was in the 1961 and 1971 conventions? I think, when was the other one? 1988 or something? Uh, talk about 80 something. The, the one that matters for psychedelics is really the 1971 convention on psychotropic yes. substances right there in the name. Okay. And it takes you off. Yes. But yeah, it's a progression of just... Um, expanding <laughs> regulation and control over these things so the uh, from memory i'm going to butcher this i'm sure so please <laughs> don't don't write in and complain but uh, the original convention in 61 was really just aimed at arresting a few of the prominent drugs you know your cocaines your opiums and to a degree marijuana and and it was aimed mostly at just trying to arrest international illegal trafficking that expanded tremendously with the 1971 Convention on Psychotropic Substances because therein you find the beginning of your schedules and scheduling and, and the lists get bigger and the demands on member nations gets bigger. Yeah, and that's, um, and even later the, what was it, the analog, Federal Analog Act in the United States uh, yeah, okay. So the Federal Analog Act is is not a treaty. It's just a federal statute yeah, not, that, that stands for the proposition that if something is something being a drug is going to be illegal, there has to be notice. Due, due process under Constitution requires if you're going to be charged with something, you had to have known or at least been able to be aware that it was illegal. So what the Analog Act does is kind of closes the gap between the chemicals that are specifically listed as scheduled and the lookalikes that are maybe a teensy bit different. So the story behind it is this. Clever chemists can go grab a chemical. Well, let's just say mescaline for, you know, whatever, for just mm -hmm. So they can take a mescaline um, molecule, which is illegal, and they say, okay, this is described with the following uh, atoms in the particular locations. That's a mescaline molecule. That is illegal. But you know what? If we add an extra carbon atom over here or an extra um, oxygen over there, now it's not the same chemical. So it's not illegal. A lot of that went on. This is the age of designer drugs in particular. You saw a lot of this with like tryptamines, for example. And you mm -hmm. still do. You still do. Yeah. So this federal statute was enacted to cover the gap between the DEA specifically identifying these chemicals and listing them when they weren't yet on the list. And the notion is, if it looks like a duck and talks like a duck and quacks like a duck, you're going to jail. The Analog Act has enjoyed a variety of interpretations. Some argue it's not constitutional. Some argue it is. It doesn't come up often enough that it's got a lot of vigorous appellate decisions around it. So I think it's still up for grabs. I will say this much. You don't want to be a criminal defendant whose mm -hmm. fallback is, oh, the Analog Act is illegal, because if that's all you've got left, you're probably going to jail. What I, I think there's two conditions, right, that they look at to see if it meets the condition of being an analog um i think i remember hamilton moore saying something along those lines yeah um it was, uh, from memory i'm not gonna be able to quote this to you. and again i don't do criminal practice so <laughs> sorry okay, about okay. that but gotcha. uh yeah there there's got to be similarity between the actual structure and i think the effect 
okay. are, are the two standards. But you're you're right. There are standards that obviously apply when you're trying to say something is metaphorically like something else, but isn't literally something else. Yeah, and this has definitely prevented a lot of research, right, into these because when you're in Schedule 1, you know, that basically makes it really difficult to get, you know, to study because you need a DAA license and then... Yeah, yeah. Um, Schedule 1 presence makes studying a compound a complete pain in the ass and vastly more difficult to do and vastly more expensive. Contrasted with a substance that isn't scheduled yet and this is a big problem that the modern pharmaceutical companies are encountering as they are trying to get their legal licit versions of these chemicals through the fda process which is happening right now there's um, iterations of psilocybin and iterations of mdma that are uh, at phase three study they're on the doorstep of fda approval which means dea is going to have to look at rescheduling um, but yeah, if you're already on schedule one, it just makes it that much harder because you've got to get all these extra permissions. You got to take all these extra precautions. You got to pay all this extra money. And then you got to think also who's behind the research. It's not just a bunch of altruistic scientists who have limitless trust funds because they were a bunch of trust fund babies. No, 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 no. This is coming from investors who are putting money into these studies not because they love you and want to do a nice thing by getting you a drug. No, they want your cash. Let's just be very, very candid about this. And I'm not speaking against money. I'm a big fan of it. I like it a lot and would like to have more of it myself. But when it comes to drug studies and drug implementation and legalization and getting things to market, you are talking about people who are driven by a profit motive, not a public good motive. Yeah, I mean, there's Money plays a huge role in why we still have the war on drugs. I mean, of mm -hmm. course, the racism and wanting to, you know, control certain groups of people and, you know, have thought control, you know, is still probably the primary, you know, reason. But money is holding is one of the other reasons. And from a lot of different directions, you got the cartels who actually like to have the war on drugs maintained, you know, because if drugs are illegal and there's always going to be a high demand for drugs. Yeah, yeah the, the war on drugs makes the cartels possible because it allows yeah. <laughs> them to be the vendor with the better price. Yeah, like if you get if the if you legalize and decriminalize drugs, they lose their major source of funding. Oh, the, right. the cartels? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. They they, <laughs> they want the war on drugs because it creates their market. Yep, and then you got certain prison industry complexes, hmm. private especially, but even the public prisons you know a lot of their money comes from you know people getting harsh, uh, prosecuted for drugs I yeah well I'm well saying. you know the thing you haven't said at all yet is why on earth do we have a criminal answer to drugs when yeah. it's a health question yeah okay so yeah why <laughs> um what is the reason oh i have no damn idea <laughs> Oh, okay. <laughs> as a civilization that's what we chose i i couldn't tell you why i don't agree with it uh but yeah we have a criminal solution to a thing that is principally a health question uh is there crime around drugs absolutely should that crime be dealt with sure you know if i've got some drug user who's breaking into my house to get money to buy drugs yeah i i expect those crimes to be prosecuted but if we're looking exclusively at the individual and their drug use, that's a health issue. That's not a crime issue. And you've got either somebody who is responsibly using the drug, in which case, why are we even talking to them or talking about them? Leave them the hell alone or they're using it irresponsibly. And then you have to ask, well, why are they using it irresponsibly? Is this an addiction problem? And if so, as we know, there are problems underlying the addiction. The addiction is the symptom, not the disease. So if that is a health issue, why are we talking criminal penalties? And ironically, the war on drugs actually hasn't solved any of the issues that it tried to, you know, in any of the addiction, you know, that it purports to, you know, try and solve, it actually makes it worse. You know, again, people have written about this, that experiment, Rat Park, Right, with rat park, um, you know, for example, if you just have a rat in a cage and you have, it can get water from two different sources, 
it can have just plain water or it can have the water with cocaine or uh, opioid or whatever you know of course it's gonna drink mostly from the one with the cocaine and it'll die and that was one of their experiments that they used to justify you know the the war on drugs but then some you know it's been a long time since i've I yeah, that's, that's, that's great logic. We force fed a rat cocaine, so cocaine bad. <laughs> I'm going to need a little uh, more than that personally. And by the way, I'm not advocating for cocaine. I don't use cocaine. I don't recommend you use cocaine, but I don't mind if you do. And I don't care if you do, uh, as long as you're not operating heavy machinery and you're doing your thing at home. We're cool. Yeah. Um but there was this experiment later. Somebody was like, wait, this doesn't see something seems wrong here, you know, because most people aren't isolated in a cage by themselves, you know. So that, um, that's Speak not like for yourself. I drink all my water out of one of those little hamster ball things. <laughs> yeah. um, but they decided to do an experiment. Okay, why don't we put a bunch of rats together? Like, you know, they're supposed to be, and, you know, they have things to do, not just that they're by themselves with nothing to do. And, they did and what they realized is they didn't need they didn't really drink the water with the cocaine very much you know because they didn't need some a coping mechanism to be able to they, they were they were socially more fulfilled uh it, it, this reminds me in um arguably probably the first chapter of my book or at least one of the earlier uh chapters in the book i have a section that talks about animals and i think i tell this this anecdote about how during the Vietnam War, there there were opium fields in Vietnam because they, they'd grow it for um, yeah. you know, extraction for medicine. And water buffalo are not known to eat opium. It's not a food thing they go for. Um, but during the war, they were observed that during bombing raids, the buffalo would get so upset they would break into the opium yeah. fields and snack on it until they calmed back down. That's so, you know... What are Buffalo figuring this out and using this responsibly? This tells you something, something important if you're paying attention. I wonder if, you know, maybe that's the reason why opium evolved in the first place. Our plants contain, you know, the opium poppy contains it. <laughs> um, oh, it, but, it, yeah. Listen, if you, if you look at natural selection as, as a genetic theory, there is an interplay between all types of species and we impact each other. Um, you know, there's a symbiosis between fungi and trees, for example. And if you go yeah. look at the world's forests and you dig beneath them, what you find is a gigantic fungal mat connecting all of it. And if you didn't have that fungi, you wouldn't have that forest. And also you can see examples of this. If you live in a place that suffers from forest fires, if you've got a region that burns so hard, hot and bad as to get down to the ground and really superheat the ground it kills the fungal mat beneath and it mm. takes longer for those regions to reforest because they don't have the fungi helping the trees out yeah that's true um and then we saw with the vietnam war veterans you know most of a lot of them got addicted to it during while they were in vietnam sure right but it makes sense i mean they're going through war and a very awful war and a lot of them didn't even know why they were fighting it and you know anything to help you know with that kind of pain but a yeah. lot most of them and when we were back, terrible until modern times about even addressing the psychic traumas of war you know if you were yeah. a world war one soldier and you had post-traumatic stress disorder guess what they didn't even have that term back then you mm -hmm. you were considered weak you were if you were lucky if you were lucky they'd say you had battle fatigue if you were lucky otherwise you were shamed and coming out of World War One, there was an explosion of alcoholism. Shocker. <laughs> and that's, by the way, how you ended up with Prohibition and then the repeal of Prohibition in a decade. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. Mm -hmm. um, we saw with a lot of those war veterans when they came back to the U.S., when they weren't in the middle of war, most of them no longer continued use. You know, the vast majority of them, obviously, there were definitely ones that did. Yeah, uh, but well, um, uh, right here in Arizona, we've got Andrew Weil, Dr. Weil, yeah. who's published extensively on this. And, and amongst his experiences he writes about was going down into Central and South America and living amongst tribes that had open access to all these plants. They lived in the freaking jungle where you'd find all this stuff. So they're literally surrounded by it. But they had a permissive culture. It was shamanic in nature, but permissive. And 
amongst things Andrew Weil comments on is, you know, in these cultures where it's just there, it's available. The kids there have zero interest in it. They don't even ask. But you come here to the United States where we've got all these taboos and prohibitions. Shocker, we've got all these problems. <laughs> you know, everybody's reaching for the forbidden fruit because we've treated it that way. We create these problems for ourselves. No, and you can flip this within one generation. Just change the culture in the U.S., change the conversation, change the culture, and things will become normalized. You're seeing this with cannabis right now. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's yeah, evolving it slow and weird, but it's evolving. Yeah, I, I agree. Carl Hart, I agree with him. Like, you know, we have to come, you know, those who use drugs of any kind who are responsible and adults need to come out of the chemical closet because that's the way we're going to be able to change our perception of what a typical heroin user might be or whatever, you know, a psychedelic user, oh, yeah. especially, you know. Um, Carl yeah, Hart, one of the best things people can do if you're willing to take the risk with whatever yeah. might befall your reputation or livelihood is yeah. come out and speak out. Yeah, and obviously it's not difficult, but we do, we do need to, we, just like cannabis, we have to, you know, back in the 30s, most, a lot of people didn't know anybody who used cannabis. So when that movie came out, what was it called um, in the 1930s? Reefer Madness? Yeah, reefer, when Reefer Madness come out, people just bought into it. They're like, oh, okay, that's what a cannabis, a marijuana user is. Oh, yeah, um, yeah. And, and you <laughs> watch Reefer Madness. It is so ridiculous. It is so ridiculous. <laughs> yeah. And, I and, in fact, it. I would recommend watch it while you're smoking a joint because it's the only way you can <laughs> a damn movie. Oh, man. Um, and then we saw, what all, and you're right, even in one generation, what happened in Portugal, you know, in 2001, they decriminalized all drugs. Yeah, and... Portugal did not snap off of Europe and fall into the ocean. It's still there. People are okay. Yeah, yeah but, and it actually improved public health. Mm -hmm. They yeah. have less teenager use, maybe because teenagers don't feel like they want to rebel and it's cool to use them now that, you know, that's not a criminal activity and it's, well, and then what else for them, less STD spread, um, but it's still illegal, you know, so you still have to get it from the black market. But if you're caught just as a user, instead of criminalizing you, you know, having you lose all your economic opportunities for the future, mm -hmm. you know, keeping you in a state that's probably going to keep you wanting to go back to drugs because keep, it's a coping mechanism, right? They actually take you to a dissuasion committee and see if you have a problem. If they don't think you have a problem, they'll just send you away. If they feel like you do have a problem, instead they'll probably, they'll get you help. Yeah. And that's actually it's done much better. It's a public health issue, not a criminal issue. But yeah. here in the United States, we prefer if you make an air quote mistake once in your life, you're going to pay for it forever. You're going to get that conviction. You're going to lose a lot of your, your civil liberties. You might go to jail for a period of time, sometimes a very long period of time. And when you get out, you're not going to be able to own a gun. You're not going to be able to vote. You're not going to be able to get uh, jobs like you would want. So yeah, you know, one minor transgression can derail an entire life and possibly an entire family's lives. It's really draconian, it's really mean-spirited, and it is counterproductive to the nation. Yeah. Well, before we end this, because I know it's been yeah, we've a been while, out. there's two last topics. So, you know, we, we can make it quick okay. that I think would be really good to finish on. Sure. Um, one, obviously, being the entheogenic churches. Yeah. Now, that's obviously a really interesting one you, because... You, you yeah. said quick topic, and that's an entheogenic church. <laughs> Um, yeah, literally impossible, yeah. but it has to be a quick topic. <laughs> but that's what do you want to know? That's a good point. What do you, what do you want yeah. to know? Well, it, it ties into almost everything we've talked about before because, you know, the, the freedom of thought, which mm -hmm. is kind of where freedom of religion comes in in the first place, right? Yeah, well, is, yeah, this all right. stems from First Amendment. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's not just freedom of thought, though, because with freedom of religion, there's also actions involved. You know, mm -hmm. people have certain moral virtues that come from that or certain practices. Sure. So now we're kind of getting freedom of action and freedom of thought with First Amendment and freedom of religion. Well, that's all the First Amendment. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, here's, here's then, what people mostly need to know about psychedelic religion in the United States. It's perfectly legal. There's there's no prohibition against psychedelic religion per se. Yeah. What you have is prohibition of Schedule One substances, but 
still subject to this First Amendment concept of religious freedom. And in our limited, and emphasis on the word limited here, uh, corpus of legal appellate decisions that have come down over the decades, we know the Supreme Court has visited with questions regarding peyote and found it perfectly okay for religious use. Ayahuasca, they found it perfectly okay for religious use. Um, I think there might be some reference in there to psilocybin, but not as strong as I'd like. But we at least have those two examples. And um, that tells you that psychedelic religion is okay. The problem is it's not well-developed law. And as you go from jurisdiction to jurisdiction, meaning state by state, you're going to encounter different cultural preferences. And the problem more often than not is if you are a person who is claiming religious exemption, you're going to be facing a prosecutor who doesn't know anything about it. You're going to yeah. be facing a court system and a judge who doesn't know anything about it and a jury possibly who doesn't know anything about it. And you're going to have to explain all of this in order to get out from under the trouble that you now find yourself in and to properly educate the prosecutor, the judge, and the jury, it means bringing in a lot of resources, and that can get expensive, which is why I often say you don't want to be the defendant in these cases. Yeah. It's not fun, and if it goes bad, bad means jail, and jail is worse. So you want to follow certain proper practices and really best practices when it comes to religious use. We don't have time to get into those details today, but I can also tell you that in um, several of the episodes of my podcast, I talk about these things. Okay. There are also fantastic lawyers around the country uh, who handle these kinds of situations and cases as I do as well. Um, and I've had several of them as guests on the podcast. So, you know, take a look and you can hear these people talk from their perspectives. Yeah, the ones I'm aware of, because obviously there's there was the two syncretic ayahuasca churches. I think there's three and actually three syncretic ayahuasca churches in Brazil. Two of them are legal in the United States. One is legal in all 50 states, I believe, the UDV, right? Unia de Vegetal, Union of the yeah, Plants. Yeah, well, it's not a question of legal in one state versus another. If if your religion and your religious practice is protected, it's protected anywhere uh, in United okay. States territory. So, you know, if you're in Guam or Hawaii or Alaska or Tennessee, if you enjoy uh, federal protection, you enjoy federal protection, period. A state can never take that away from you. Right. What about Santo Daime? Um, or, or even, you know, the church... Yeah, that what is it, the Peyote Way Church of God? Mm -hmm. You know, they're in Arizona. I don't think you can just open up a branch anywhere. Uh, correct. So now, now you're talking state law, and the the problem at the state level is states have varied tolerance on these issues. So, like with the Peyote Way Church of God, for example, they got in trouble in Texas because Texas didn't have this Peyote religious exemption thing. Um, theoretically, they could have continued to fight on and and gotten some sort of a federal appellate decision that would have resolved this for them in theory, mm -hmm. uh, but it just didn't work out that way. And Arizona has and had at the time and always had this special extra statute. So it just path of least resistance. It made sense to set up shop here. So they did. Does that have to do with, you know, and the same goes with cannabis, right? The ninth and 10th amendments, which have to do with like state rights versus individual rights mm -hmm. and federalism uh, kind of um you know the from the concept of jurisdictions being separate federal laws are federal laws and federal courts can can adjudicate those federal laws state laws are state laws and state courts adjudicate those state laws and they can overlap so for example you have the federal controlled substances act but if you look at arizona's uh, statutes, we have a corollary state level controlled substances act. And you'll find this in, uh, most other states, probably all other states. Do the states have to enact their own drug laws? No, they don't have to, but it makes logical sense that they choose to, and they do. And it can parallel, uh, it can even contradict some of the permissiveness that federal law allows. So, 
you know, federal law, for example, could allow, I don't know, drug acts, pick whatever you want. And state law could say, nah, you know, we, we don't, we don't want drug acts in our state. So that that's not permitted. Um, a slight example of that you might notice right now is happening with like Kratom. So Kratom mm -hmm. is bubbling up again and becoming very controversial again. Yeah. And yeah, Kratom, the American Kratom Association, I recommend everyone look at the work that they're doing. You know, they're the reason probably why Kratom is still illegal in some states, you know, and is, you know, the Kratom, what is it, the Kratom Protect, Protection Act, I don't remember, and that they're fighting in different states, like Arizona, it's legal, but they're like, I think Indiana, it's criminal. Events to, to yeah, as you, you really have to check state by state. And by the way, if you're sending Kratom across state lines, you got to be double careful because if it's tripping over a state that has it as illegal, you could be committing a, a, a state felony, not even realizing you did it. So be very careful with that. And and by the way, the American Kratom Association, uh, you and I actually spoke about this, Adam, several months ago. I yeah. accidentally stumbled upon that organization and discovered that um, – former Arizona politician, Matt Salmon, is the director of that organization. So I actually reached out to them, hoping to catch an interview with Matt Salmon. Uh, of course, they never did me the courtesy of writing me back. So if on the off chance anybody knows Matt Salmon, or even freakier, Matt Salmon, if you're listening to this podcast, I'd really like to interview you because I think you'd be a fascinating interview. And I would love to hear uh, how you, you, Matt Salmon, came to be connected with Kratom because I'll, I'll be honest, I was shocked when I read it. I was super impressed. I would never have imagined in a million years a conservative Arizona politician would have been in support of this. And I was thrilled to see it. And I know there's a story there that's worth telling. Okay, no very last one, unless I'm missing something. Uh, going forward, you know, the FDA, you know, MDMA and psilocybin and going forward in the future and the future and activism and, you know, the decrim movements. What's the way forward? What are we looking? What's the law looking like? You know, and how's it going to change in the next few years? And, you know, what should we know? Oh, which law? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. And yeah, I mean, the, the Food and Drug Administration is not going away anytime soon. And they do tremendous good work. Look, the, the fact that you're able to go to your grocery store and not buy a bunch of stuff that's going to kill you the moment you open the box, thank the FDA. And also the U.S. Department of Agriculture, too. They're a big reason. They're a part of our public safety net. And by the way, for people who rail against government and the federal government, um, no, no, no. You you want an FDA. You don't want to live in a world without an FDA. Trust me on that. If you look at American history before the FDA, oh, my God. Uh, the amount of toxic and adulterated products that that were available that people were getting seriously injured with it would shock you. So you want to embrace these agencies. That being said, if you don't like the way they operate, that's okay. It's all human made laws and regulations. So what's the path forward if you're aggrieved with these agencies? Number one, you can contact them and air your grievance. Number two, you can write your Congress people and air your grievance. Number three, you can go work for these agencies. You can even become an agency head if you've got the right credentials. And guess what? If you become the agency head, you get to steer the bus. And that's a great thing. And it's a, one of the best things about living in a vibrant democracy is that we all get to participate in meaningful ways. So I'm going to turn this into a political thing now after saying I wouldn't, but uh, we've got important elections coming up. And if you are not a voter, please rethink that. This is a participatory democracy, and it only works if you participate. And if you don't, then I personally think you don't get any bitch rights. You get what you get because you couldn't be bothered to even get off your butt to vote. Your voting matters and everybody's vote counts. And I'm not saying what to vote for. I'm not saying who to vote for. But I am saying if you care about a participatory democracy, you need to fulfill your civic duty and participate. Yeah. With the FDA, we have the right to try laws in some cases, right? And then MDMA and psilocybin, are going through these clinical trials and are going to be re are going to have to be approved as a medicine are going to be approved as a mm -hmm. medicine by the FDA and therefore have to be rescheduled by the DEA at least medically because yeah. obviously ketamine is mm -hmm. and a schedule one for recreational and schedule three medically use or something along those lines so that's one path forward 
to gaining some legalization and regulation and acceptance, you know, as a path forward. And, and that's the thing, like right now, uh, in the air quotes here, illicit channels of, of drugs, meaning that it's going through studies and getting FDA approval and DEA rescheduling. That's great. I'm in full support of that because that it, a puts people in their comfort zone. Like, like, you know, my parents, they're going to want to go to their doctor and, you know, see the guy in the white lab coat and that makes them comfortable. I have no quarrel with that. But the cool thing is as these psychedelic substances start to get into our Licit legal pharmacopoeia, it will elevate people's awareness and make them more curious. And this will and expand the conversation, expand the interest, expand the knowledge, and in turn start to shift the culture. And you know, maybe, maybe it leads to more grassroots movements, and maybe ultimately where we've led into deep regulation, we can now find that, oh, you know what, things are okay. We can start to deregulate it, but leave it available instead of just prohibition. That's my hope. I'm hoping there's a cultural shift and I think it, it will happen. It's just a question of how quickly. Yeah. And then the decriminalization movements, decrim nature and the different cities yeah. is a good move. Some states like Arizona, no, Arizona may not. The Good Samaritan, is that what it's called? Good Samaritan laws, where if you get caught using these things and you're in a like a dangerous situation and they take you to the hospital or your friend has to take you to the hospital, that they don't have to turn you in. You know, some states have that. Oh, yeah, some some states do. Um, I, I don't specifically know what Arizona's position is on that. Okay. So, yeah, that's it. I mean, I, unless I'm missing anything, I you know, I'd highly recommend everyone definitely read his books. You know, um, I do need to get his Arizona one still. Yeah. Uh, and again, <laughs> the, the two books are, the first one is um, Psychedelic Alex, The Law of Psychedelics. And this is a chunkier book. And let me just tell you at home a little bit about it. Again, this came about because I went looking for this book and nobody wrote it, so screw it, I did. And what it's intended to be is kind of an intro survey book to the variety of legal issues that sort of dog psychedelics. And it's more than that, though, because I've got little chapters on history and I've got some amusing stuff. Like I mentioned earlier, I've got a chapter in there about animals that use psychedelics and animals that are psychedelic. And I've got a glossary in the back, and I've got one of the uh, public uh, initiatives that went through the, the Colorado psilocybin uh, bill, so you can see what that looks like. And it's it's not a deep dive on any discrete topic, but it's a great survey that will introduce you to a lot of these legal topics. And I also wrote it with a ton of annotations. I tried to find as many legal citations as I could so that it's actually a usable legal practitioner's manual. Hmm. I also try to write it at uh, an accessible level to non-lawyers. In fairness, not every topic lends itself well to being accessible to non-lawyers, but I tried to get you as close as I could. So I took pains to make this readable. I hope it is. If not, oh, well, what can I do? But I'm not, I'm not a lawyer and I've been able to understand it so far. So I think it's <laughs> perfect. Anyway, that's the big book. And then the, the, the tiny fun book, which is absolutely accessible to everybody, including people who can't read, because, again, there are lots of fun color pictures in it. Uh, but it's this one, Psychedelic Arizona which is, again, just a whimsical sort of touristy tchotchke, you know, here's everything psychedelic about Arizona. Uh, if you want to irritate your grandma, it's a perfect gift. Yeah. All right. And check out his website, Psychedelica Lex, if you just go on Google or. Yeah, it's um, same title as the book, same title as the podcast, same title as the website, Psychedelica. That's basically psychedelic with an A at the end, space Lex, which is Latin for law of psychedelics. Yeah, and we just barely covered the surface. Uh -huh. But I hope that this podcast was helpful. Again, we want to thank Gary for coming on to the podcast. Uh, please read his books because we need to move forward and end this war on drugs. And <laughs> totally agree. Anyway, Adam, it's been a pleasure. Really appreciate yep. it. Thanks so much.